everyone. Thank you all for being here. I'm Tina. I'd like to thank you all for coming out to AFMX and on behalf of our board of directors and our entire volunteer staff. We are so thankful for everyone coming out and supporting everyone. So we'd also like to thank our sponsors, which is AFME Foundation, Albuquerque Film and Media Foundation, Albuquerque Film and Media Incubator, Albuquerque Film Office and Film Liaison, Cindy McCrossan, Albuquerque County Commission, Steve Michael Cusada, Brisa Terra Olive Oil, Enchantment Rain Films, I Heart Media, Larry Swartz and Well Fargo Advisors, Jowska Road Productions, Matucci Bar Roma, Real Solutions Airport Meet and Greet Services, Sunny 505, The Historic Lobo Theater, University of New Mexico Film and Digital Arts, and Quiet Media. So we're going to have them come out here in just a moment. I'm so happy to have Carrie Rose O'Donnell, and I'd like to introduce her and have her come out. Wonderful. And we are very happy to have Josh, Josh, thank you, Josh Friedman back with us. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over, and if Josh would like to come on out. All right. We were going to do a whole dance and stuff, but it didn't go that well. I said no dancing. Yeah. <laughs> said no dancing. <laughs> I should have danced. I didn't. I, she still can. Would you like to? No, we'll wait till later. Okay. Yeah, I'll do a little later. Well played, sir. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks, everybody, so much. Um, my name is Carrie Rose O'Connell. We did not have my bio, but, you know, if you don't know who I am, just grab me in one of the hallways, and I'll be happy to tell you all about that. I'm the founder and owner of the Albuquerque Film and Media Incubator, and we're here to help independent content creators understand the business of the industry so they can create sustainable careers for themselves. Um, I'm very thrilled to have a dear friend, uh, Joshua Friedman, join us today. Um, and so I just want to read you quickly his background, and then we'll get started. Joshua A. Friedman is a producer, DGA assistant director, tech CEO, and author of Getting It Done, The Ultimate Production Assistant Guide. He started his decade-long career as a production assistant on Law & Order Criminal Intent, working his way into the Directors Guild as an assistant director on Person of Interest. Mr. Friedman began producing in 2016 with the feature film Warning Shot, which allowed him to span productions both above and below the line. He most recently worked as an AD on Peacock's Dr. Death, Miracle Man, and as a producer on the upcoming feature film Birder, which sounds super intense, by the way. His expertise in the industry led to the creation of a free mobile app, Crew Me Up, which we're going to be demonstrating today. It is a labor management system which bring, bridges the gap between people and productions. So if we could have one more round of, of applause for our guest today. Thank you. Um, Thanks. Thank you, Carrie. Um, also, the reason I'm here literally reached out to me on LinkedIn, what, two years ago? So, yeah, last year I stalked you on LinkedIn. And I saw a women in film organization talking about Crew Me Up. And so I started looking into Crew Me Up. And this is really how you network in this industry internationally. So Completely random reach yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. So I looked up Crew Me Up. I thought it was an interesting concept. So I started researching who developed it. I saw Joshua Friedman. And so I messaged him on LinkedIn. And I just basically said that I thought he was cool. Told him a little bit about myself and thought we should connect. And he was like, hey, what's up? And I was like, you need to fly to Albuquerque and be a presenter in this festival. And that was last year. So now we're a year anniversary in, and you're back to dazzle us again. And just to give you a little set the stage, I am a moderator up here, but Josh likes to just do his own thing. He's a free bird. So you're going to see him kind of get up and wander around, sit down, do some gymnastics. But I'll tap in when I can. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so, yeah, I started the same way last year. I, I have serious trouble sitting. Um, what we do is completely mobile. I spend a lot of time working on sets out of trucks, honey wagons, and literally sitting down for three minutes at a time, getting up, running to an actor's trailer, coming back, sitting down for three minutes, running to set, coming back, sitting down for three minutes. Um, so I'm going to do this standing, and then we'll come back when the time comes. Okay, that sounds good. I'll be here. Awesome. <laughs> I'm his anchor. 
It's true. It's true. I need a blanket. Um, so exactly what Carrie Rose said, the whole purpose of this is to share with you the journey that I've experienced over the last decade and a half from becoming a production assistant in film and television in New York to becoming an assistant director, becoming a producer, and now running Crew Me Up and actually educating, doing workshops, and trying to build infrastructure and communities, very similar to what we're all doing here in Albuquerque. So that journey started fresh out of college. I was 21, 22 years old. This was 2005. Uh, I studied theater, so I have a degree in stage management and performance. I knew nothing about film, I knew nothing about television, blocking PAs, assistant directors. I was a stage manager, um, which is the closest thing in theater that you can get to being an assistant director. Um, we don't do blocking, we don't handle rehearsals past telling them what to do while the director actually does the work. Um, and we definitely don't reset props like people do in theater. But logistics, management, and pulling this all together is a very big part of the AD role. And that starts with being a PA. So I moved to New York, again, 2005. My guidance counselor in high school, uh, she was married to this guy, John Roman, who was the producer of Law and Order Criminal Intent. And so I called him up when I moved to New York, and I said, hey man, I'm here, I'm excited, I'm ready to work. And he went, great, good luck. <laughs> I can also tell how old I am by how I make a phone. Um, you remember when we used to hang up on people? <laughs> I still do. <laughs> Uh, so, so John literally hung up that phone, and I, I got a bartending job in New York, like most do, and I started looking at all the opportunities that were on Craigslist and Mandy.com at the time. Uh, I did student films, I worked for free, and this went on for about a year. So literally, I was spending all night at a bar from about 4 p.m. to 4 a.m., and then going to sets from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m., and working days on, days off. I never took a break, and I called John up about a year later, and I said, this is what I've been doing. I'm still doing small independent productions. I haven't been able to break into the union world. Do you have any guidance or someone that I can speak to that would be able to help me take that next step? And so within two weeks of that, I got a call from Gary Rake, who was the second AD on Law and Order Criminal Intent Season 7, and he said, do you want to be a walkie PA? I said, I don't know what that is, but yeah. And so that was it. Uh, within two months, I was on set, and that was kind of the beginning of the end for me. So I'm on Law & Order. I'm a production assistant. I'm a walk EPA, and I don't know what my job is. What's next? Um, any thoughts? What's next? Anybody that was here last year? Oh, absolutely not. Uh, honestly, had I done that, like, fake it till you make it is great. But you have to be trying to make it at a certain level. If you try to fake it when you're on your way up, they'll call you out, and then they'll go to the next person in line. So honestly, I ask questions. I, I am completely fallible. Even now, you know, 15 plus years in the business, all the experience as a first AD, um, I've done some directing, very rarely. So I, I have all of these things under my belt that I can pull from, and I still constantly make mistakes. So talk to people, ask. And that's, that's exactly what I did. I, I was positioned at craft services. So imagine this big table of food, literally about the size of this carpet. And I'm standing in front of it, and when the AD calls rolling, I say, shh, we're rolling, quiet, quiet. And that's all I did. And I listened to the walkie-talkie, and day after day after day, scene after scene after scene, the same things were repeated. First team rehearsal's up, marking rehearsal's up, director's rehearsal is up. And so I started to understand what these pieces were and what was needed for all these elements. And one day I'm standing at Crafty and he goes, all right, we've got a uh, private director's rehearsal, which in my mind triggers the next thing that we're gonna have to do is a marking rehearsal. What do I need for a marking rehearsal? I need department heads, I need camera people with marks. I need stand-ins to watch what the actors are doing so they can repeat it when we go to actually light. And so I started to look around the stage for all these people. And as soon as they finished that rehearsal, I had literally tapped everybody on the shoulder and said, get ready, get ready, get ready. The second they called marking, all those folks walked in. I'm now at Crafty. My boss comes on the walkie-talkie. He goes, all right, let's get our department. Let's rehearse. 
So we got ahead, and that's, that's really how I learned, by listening, by asking questions, by observing the process, and it's all repeatable. It's gonna be adapted. So every production is different, every scene, every setup, there's different challenges, but the process is still the same, and if you can hold on to that cycle, which we'll get into later, then you will absolutely be successful. So, we're now on Law & Order. It's about 2007, I am a walkie production assistant. What that means is that I am in charge of walkie-talkies, uh, inventory, tracking numbers, passing them out to departments, and making sure that we have hot batteries on set, which also means collecting the cold ones, recharging them so that they're hot and ready, and then recycling this, as well as planning all of the extra units. So does anybody know what a tandem unit is? Raise your hands. So a tandem unit in film and television is a separate shooting crew that is shooting simultaneously to the main unit. So an example of this would be if you're shooting inserts, anything that doesn't involve the actor's face that involves an object, like picking up a phone, would be an insert. I need a hand. It doesn't have to be that actor's hand. And during a season of television, we don't have the time to shoot these inserts while we're actually shooting the scene with the actor. We also don't have the time to tack that on at the end of our episode schedule. So what we'll do is a tandem unit. So while that main unit is shooting, a whole separate crew will go out and shoot these inserts simultaneously. So as a walkie PA, I had to know when the tandem units were coming up, and I also had to prepare for that, pass those out, collect those when the two-day shoot was over. And so that was the job at the time. And I did this for half a season on Law & Order, and then my very good friend Vadim, who was the background PA on that season, got a job as an assistant director on a movie called Frozen River. And he said, bye bye And then I turned to the bosses and said, if he's going, can I have his job? And so I had spent every night from probably the fourth or fifth week on the set hanging out with this guy in holding, filling out extra vouchers, creating the background breakdown at the end of the night, tracking everything and learning what he does. And so once I explained to them that this is what I've been doing and this is what I would like to do, and it's important to know this because if I hadn't asked for the opportunity, I would not have had it. They would have gone out and hired someone else and I would have been a walkie PA for the rest of the season. But because I asked, they gave me the background PA position and I then learned a whole new skill set. So now we're dealing with extras. We've mentioned vouchers, which is the actor's time card. Um, we've mentioned, what else did I mention? Uh, all kinds of stuff, Josh. So many things. So many things. Um, you did all kinds of stuff. The background breakdown. Um, so I, I knew how to do the background breakdown, which is a summary of all the information on the voucher, all the actors that have been there during the day, what time they were in, when they broke, um, any bumps or adjustments they get, uh, clothing changes, props that they brought. There's all kinds of rules. I highly recommend that you read the SAG after contract, especially after they finish renegotiating it. Um, rates are constantly changing, but the rules are basically the same. So once you understand the basic concepts, and this applies to any union contract, know the basics, such as we're gonna start our day, and six hours after that, we're gonna break. And if we don't, it's probably gonna cost somebody money. Um, it's a good thing to know because if you don't break at six hours, your crew's gonna start to get grumbly. And it's okay if you don't break at six hours as long as you've communicated that you're not gonna be able to break and the crew is compensated. So I've been in these situations a few times and department heads will come at me really hot and really hard. Yo man, we're not breaking, like what are you gonna do about it? Well, you're still on the clock, right? Yeah, so I'm gonna pay you till you get food and you break. And they just go, oh. And they walk away, and there's no harm, no foul. Um, so as long as people know what's going on and know that they're being treated fairly, it's gonna be fine. A lot of that comes from understanding the rules, and that comes from reading the contract. Um, especially as a background PA, since there's all these things that we have to follow, including the rates and the different types of background. So we know that we've got stand-ins. We've mentioned those. They stand in for the actors. We've got regular backgrounds which are the folks in the crowd scenes. We call them ND, or nondescript. And then we've also got featured background. Uh, featured doesn't necessarily mean anything other than they're a bartender, they're a waiter, 
or in the script it says a certain person does a certain thing at a certain time. Those would be featured players. And then we've also got special ability. Riding a bike is a special ability. You get paid for it. Roller skating. Um, anything that you can do that is required of you for that scene that goes above and beyond just walking through, um, they can give you a bump and pay for. So very important to know these rules as a production assistant and as an AD because it's going to factor into everything later. So background PA on Law and Order. I uh, did that for a season. And after that, I, I realized being on a TV show is great. Having steady work is fantastic. I was doing 10 months a year with a two month break, and then 10 months a year with a two month break, making $7 an hour, but we don't have to go there. Um, so after that, I decided I need to get into features. And I was very lucky. Um, somebody that I had worked for on Law and Order mentioned me to a UPM, and they brought me onto this movie called The Beaver. And The Beaver was directed by Jodie Foster, starred Mel Gibson, Anton Yelchin, and Jennifer Lawrence, um, long before she was who she is. So we left Law & Order and we went to The Beaver. Um, paperwork was my job on The Beaver. And so what I did there is I basically tracked information and communicated. And this, this job is interesting. It's given to PAs on the East Coast. It's not usually given to PAs on the West Coast or in a place like this, which is third area. It's given to assistant directors. But what we do is we collect names for the call sheet so we know who is coming to work tomorrow and who's here today. And we also do the production report, which is a record of what happened. So it includes all the scenes that we plan to shoot, notes from the script supervisor about how many takes, what was shot, what kind of setups we did. Um, it also includes information about the actor's time cards, the background, that background breakdown literally translates directly to the front of the PR like we spoke about. And then on the back is all the names of the people that worked, their in time, their out time, any penalties that they have. There's also a notes section at the bottom. So if anything happened, this is a living record. And so I can go back and I can read this document months later and I can basically recreate exactly what happened this day if there was a problem that reflects back to budget, if there was something that needs to be addressed, or I can compare it to the call sheet and just look and see, okay, this is what we planned to do and this is what we did. Well, that was a great day. Um, so paperwork was a very big thing. And with paperwork, you also start to understand all of the other departments paperwork and what they do. So with the walkie PA, their paperwork is called a walkie inventory. And that, uh, it's basically a list of walkies with the walkie numbers and what department they're assigned to. With the background PA, they collect the vouchers, which get turned into accounting. We also collect that background breakdown and we have to check the background breakdown because from the production report, it goes to the production manager and from the production manager to the accounting department. This is how the crew gets paid. And if it's wrong, we're gonna be very, very unhappy. So that was, uh, that was the background PA position. And then from there, there were only two staff positions that I hadn't worked yet. First team PA, which takes care of the principal actors, and key PA. And I dabbled a little bit as a key because as a walkie PA, when those tandem units that I mentioned came up, the key would go, well, you're part of the staff, you're gonna go key that. And so I would do these smaller units, which were two or three scenes, not necessarily with the main actors, maybe with day players or maybe it was driving shots or something a little less complicated. And I would go out and I would key that. So I would have to find my staff. Any additional PAs I would get to hire. I would set lockups. So once we know what the scene is and what the space is that we're working at, I would put humans at specific points on the corners outside of the set area to protect us and keep us safe and then listen to the ADs and stand by for the next instruction. And basically, we're just there to protect and facilitate communication. So as a key PA, the experience was great, but definitely not the most fun I've had. Paperwork was great because I was constantly learning, and it gave me an opportunity to connect with every single department and speak to every department head, learn what they're doing, learn what everything's about. And, uh, and then we ran into first team. So my first team experience was Joshua, on. Yes. Can I ask you a question, really Please. quick? What's the importance of knowing all the departments, especially? Oh, I had one more that we were going to get there. You want to be in the first AD track. Um, 
Go one ahead. more PA position, and then we can get to the AD. Okay. Um, so first team, um, I'll sit for this. <laughs> so first team is dealing with principal actors. And we mentioned their time card, which is called an Exhibit G. So the first team PA is responsible for recording all the information once they land, when they sit in hair and makeup, when they go to set, when they're dismissed from set, when they break for lunch. All of these things get recorded in that paperwork. And so that person is literally a handler, handler and a facilitator for actors. A hamburger? Yeah, a, ham, a hamburger. <laughs> um, so first team PA brings them to their trailer, gets them set up, make sure they have sides, water, breakfast. They also help hair and makeup and support them. So if they can't break away from their trailer because they're working on an actor, they help them get food, they help them get something to drink. We're all human, and I would hope that in the opposite situation, they might grab something for the PA who can't break away from base camp. And so they then get those actors into hair and makeup, from hair and makeup into costume. So they bring them back to the trailer, inform the costumer that the actor's ready to dress, and then stand by to inform the ADs that everything's ready and we can bring them to set. So very important. Like Carrie Rose was alluding to, all five of these positions equal one assistant director. So the whole point of this is from PA to the DGA. And in order to join the DGA, there's a few things that you can do. My personal track was as an assistant director. And to do that, you can work 600 days as a production assistant, uh, keep all your call sheets, keep all your production reports, and keep all your pay stubs. This is going to be important because you have to put it all into a book. I literally had four three-inch binders with all this paperwork organized with tables of contents, chronological order, that then gets submitted and delivered to the Director's Guild in order to become an AD. If you don't want to go the 600 days in the PA route, or if you've already started your career and you're an assistant director on non-union projects, you can do 400 days. Same process, call sheets, production reports, pay stubs, but you can turn in less. And then there's another way to get in, which is the DGA training program. That was something that I tried uh, twice and failed both times. So the process starts with basically taking an SAT. And 300 people sit in a room, they take this aptitude test, and the top 10% then go on to one-on-one -on -one interviews with a third party that the DGA hires. And from those interviews, they take the top 10%, and they go on to a panel interview with the DGA board. And then from there, they choose anywhere from three to 10 DGA trainees on the East Coast and on the West Coast every year. So very competitive, but that's the fast track. You only need 350 days. As a non-unity, again, 400, and as a production assistant, 600. So those 600 days, all that time, and the reason that there's so many is because of all five of those positions and all those skills that you're going to acquire as you grow and become that AD. And unfortunately, there are situations where production assistants don't get that staff experience. And so I know folks that have six to 800 days and they're all from standing on a corner and doing lockups. So now they are eligible to join the Director's Guild, but they're not necessarily prepared. And so that's why we come to these things and speak. And, and it's why you take initiative, right? Like sometimes they're standing on that corner after 600 days because they didn't say, can I help with that? True, yeah. very true. Yeah. Um, I think that's one of the important things about your particular track that mm -hmm. shouldn't be... Um, undervalued is the amount of authenticity you approached it with as far as just being able to admit to people when you didn't know how to do something but showing like a willingness to learn and a motivation to grow and I think that presents itself in a way where that helps accelerate the process for you versus somebody that might sit back and take a little less initiative. Absolutely. Um, there, there's a phrase that I remember using a lot. I don't know but I'll find out. Um, and that's it. I'm honest, but I'll work on it. Um, everything needs a solution. The people that I come back to, uh, PAs, assistant directors, producers, anybody that I work with, whenever a problem is presented, they come to me either with a solution or they'll work with me to figure it out. The second we start reiterating the problem and repeating ourselves or going, I don't know, 
we're done. And unfortunately, I, I don't have time. We've seen how fast things work. I did four episodes of television in, uh, let's see, we shot it in 40, 45 days. Um, so that's a monster pace. Uh, we're doing 60 pages in 10 day episodes. Sometimes we've got tandems. Um, I'll tell you a story at the end about how the end of Dr. Death worked for me. Um, it was fantastic and it was absolute craziness. Um, but we'll get there. So you, you actually mentioned a good thing. We talked about the set. And something that enabled me to understand where I needed to be or where I needed to go as both a PA and an assistant director was explained to me by this guy, Tony Philippe. Um, we had just done a show called The Following, and he brings me to uh, Columbus Circle, and we're in the, uh, the top of the Time Warner building at a bar, like looking out over Central Park. He pulls out a napkin, and he just starts drawing a bullseye on this napkin. And he draws four or five concentric circles, and he goes, this is the set. And he points to the bullseye, and he goes, this is the camera. And this is the center of set. It's supported by three legs, the director, the DP, and the first AD. And as long as those three legs are strong and communicating and working together, that camera is supported. That's my world. You're my key PA. So I point to the next circle. I go, so this is my world? He goes, no. That's the second AD's world, and that's the second second's world, and they're protecting the set and the interior, and they're communicating with department heads and doing the things that I need. And I pointed to the next one, I go, that's mine. He goes, no, that's the crew. <laughs> and I, so I point outside the circle, he goes, yeah, you're protecting us from everything else, and all of your PAs along the outside edges, they're protecting us. So it's another fun trick that I learned. A lot of times when you're first on set, it's really cool and everybody wants to watch everything. So you kind of face the camera and you face the action, but you're missing everything that you're protecting us from behind you. So if you wanna get ahead and you want people to notice and start bringing you back, keep your back to the camera, keep your back to the scene. It's okay to look. Like We're not saying don't look at all, but literally. You can protect us by, is anybody coming out of here? Is anybody coming out of there? I've got Carrie Rose here. I've got some peripherals on the camera right to my left. But I can always look over my shoulder and see y'all. So we call it head on a swivel or just make sure that you're focused away from set and then checking in when you need to. Um, very, very important. Watch out for Carrie Rose on the perimeter. <laughs> Bless. Um, so, so that was, that was honestly my journey and my journey, like we said, is as an assistant director. Now, if you want to be a director, there's a very different path. Um, all you have to do, honestly, is direct. So find a story, find a project and become signatory with the DGA. So it's hours, it's work days. Um, because I'm not a director, I don't actually know how many exactly, but it's very clear on the DJ website. Once you meet those requirements, then you can join. Um, honestly, just start directing and you will get there. You can also join as a location manager and it's the same thing, PA days. We also have unit production managers, which are the AD track. And so with that, we can probably get into the AD track. Let's talk about the AD track, Joshua. So, I did my 600 days as a production assistant. I was on person of interest. Uh, literally, we are at a ferry terminal. I'm sitting in the honey wagon as a paperwork PA. And on the walkie talkie, I hear from the second AD, um, I need my second AD here, Josh Friedman. Can I get my second AD? I had no idea what she was talking about, but apparently somebody hadn't showed up and they gave me a bump. So that was my first day and I go into this ferry terminal and there's Jim Caviezel and the woman playing his wife. And it's this very touching scene and there's 150 extras that all need to be set. So <laughs> I was a second deal. second and, and that's really what we do. So three ADs on set, the first AD, the second AD, and the second second AD. So the second second is responsible for mostly the background and being on set to be the right hand person for the first AD. So 
if the first AD says, after the shot, we're gonna turn around, meaning we're not looking this way, but we're looking in the opposite direction. The second second will then go to all the department heads and say, after the shot, we're gonna turn around. Or they'll turn to the PAs and say, we've got some crafty or water bottles or gear in that shot. Let's move it now so that we can get ahead. They also check the paperwork. So they check that background breakdown. They check the production report to make sure that everything is copacetic because the other ADs are a little too busy doing all the other things. So it's nice that those folks have a break and can back us up. So you work as a second second and a second second and a key second are the same category in the DGA. There's a little bit of a difference in pay rate. There's a little bit of a different, or there's a lot of difference in responsibility. Um, but for all intents and purposes, they're both second ADs. The key second AD is actually responsible for a lot more of the logistics and starts much earlier. So we start in prep. And during that prep phase, we support the first as they go out and they have their director scouts. And director scouts are literally looking at locations to say, do I want to shoot here? And once we finally pick those, then we'll come back with the crew and we'll do an actual tech scout. During prep, it starts with the scouting, then it's breakdowns. So while that director and first AD are out scouting, the second AD is doing a background breakdown, very rough based on the script, pulling out any uh, wardrobe notes, camera notes, prop notes, costume notes, and all of that is gonna then be used over the coming weeks before production to have all these meetings with all these different department heads. And sometimes we group meetings. Like I can tell you I've done VFX, graphics, art, props, and stunts all in one meeting. It took two hours to go through the whole scripts. We go from start to finish, scene by scene. We ask, does anybody have anything that they need to pay attention to in this? Any concerns, anything that needs to be figured out, questions to be asked? And once the answer is no, we finish that meeting and move on. Um, now in features, we have time to do this and it's lovely. On a show like Dr. Death, there, there were times where I was getting a script and we had maybe four days, five days tops to prep it. And that includes all of that scouting, all of those meetings, and cameras are rolling on day six. So grouping these meetings and having these conversations very in depth, going through beat by beat, scene by scene, trust, trust your department heads, very important. Um, listen to them and let them help you because with all that, we cannot do it alone. Second AD, we're in prep, finally get through that. Now we have to actually build the call sheet. So everybody here knows what a call sheet is? Sure, thanks. Uh, a call sheet is a plan for the day. So at the top is the call time and the information on where you need to go and what time you need to be there. Then there's the schedule, which includes the scene number. Is this an interior or an exterior? What is the set? And what I mean by that is what is the set in the script, not the actual location. Like this could be a Broadway theater for all we know, yet we're in Albuquerque. So it would say interior Broadway theater on the call sheet, and then to the right of that, the actual location, historic Lobo Theater. We also do a slug to remind you what this scene is about. Um, so like a small description that sums up the action. And we do this because we shoot out of order. So scenes one through 200, I might start on scene 156 and then go to 158 and then go to 200 and then drop back down to five. Um, we do this because it's based on location and efficiency. So we wanna move as little as possible. So as many scenes as you have in that location, you're gonna shoot all of those out. There are times when you leave and come back, but usually that's because there's some kind of changeover or reset. Um, let's say you're going from day to night. You'll shoot the day work, you'll go out, shoot a different scene somewhere else, come back once it's relit for night. Or if the lighting changeover is fast enough, you might just take that time and turn it over full well knowing what's next. Uh, if I was to hire a new green fresh PA on my set, what qualities would I look for? First is listen, very important. I've got an intern right now and she is incredible. She does our social media, she does graphic design, and every time I say something, she goes, yeah, 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 yeah. And I know she hears me, but I don't know if she's actually taking it in and listening, because I haven't finished a complete thought before she's given a response. So the first thing that I actually look for is listening. The second thing is I look for folks that are gonna take that initiative that we've been talking about, 
like the rehearsal process, knowing what we need, they're gonna go out and get those people and get ahead of what's going on before we actually get there. So I, I really look for people that can anticipate and communicate. Um, that's the other big thing. So a lot of times we start with the why before we start with the what, which means somebody's playing catch up trying to understand the context that you're trying to explain. So anybody that can help me understand immediately what you need and why you need it allows me to give you an immediate solution, and those are the people that I will instantly bring back. I have a little follow-up question for you. Um, so this initiative that you took and you recommend for PAs to take, you know, anticipating what's needed, getting things in place ahead of time, there's also a delicate balance on sets yes. to not kind of cross over a line and go into an area maybe you shouldn't be going into. So how do you especially when you're green and you don't know a lot, how do you balance that initiative with not actually then stepping into another department and doing something you shouldn't have done? Um, is it separate? You, you separate what you do and do not do. So, for example, you don't touch gear unless you're given permission. Um, I'm, I'm happy to carry things when, when I'm able to, but I will not touch a camera case. I will not touch a lens. I will not touch a C-stand unless I've gotten confirmation from a best person or a department head that I can do that. Because if it breaks or if I did something wrong, it's on me for taking that initiative. You know, if it goes great, great, fine, no harm, no foul. But it's the off chance that something happens that can get you in a lot of trouble. So honestly, I, I move people, I spread information, but rarely do I move gear. How do you take initiative when you're so new that you don't know what to do? The answer is wait. Uh, also, also great advice. Listen, pay attention. So the two weeks that I told you about where I was locking up Crafty, I was listening to what was going on and that, that was how I learned. So you don't have to show initiative immediately. You have to get better. Um, something to remember about your path in this journey as you keep going from job to job. Nobody remembers how you started a job. Everybody remembers how you left it. So it doesn't matter what happens in the beginning. You're going to make mistakes. It's OK. Just don't make the same mistakes. As you get better, that's what people will see. And I, I would definitely hire someone who I saw an improvement in, even if they're not as good as someone else who's on the table. Because I know that they've got room to grow. And that other person thinks they know what they're doing. And while they might have some room to grow, I don't know whether or not they're actually going to take that effort to make the, uh, the difference. If you want to be a director, go out and direct. If you want to be a better director, go work on a film set and take that experience, take what you saw in the way that everybody interacts and works together, and bring that to your directing and to your projects. Um, that, that's honestly what I did. So I, like I said, started on Law & Order. I started in the union world, which was very opposite to a lot of my friends who started on indies. And when I became an assistant director, there's a very toxic environment which has been going away more and more. And honestly, it's, it's mostly gone now, um, at least from the AD perspective. And I got out. I, I stopped doing union work. I stopped ADing on union projects. And I only did the non-union work. And I got caught for it. I got in trouble. But I, I brought all of that skill and all of that experience and structure to those non-union projects. And those people ended up benefiting and upping the quality of their productions. And then they went on to join the unions. And now they're doing things that are bigger than things I do. So I want to kind of take you a little bit further now into your career and how you're supporting community. Mm -hmm. So I think... I think what you're, you've done a lot in a short period of time and you should be acknowledged for that. It's, you know, it's really impressive. And so I think that what I was most impressed when I first saw Crew Me Up and the work that you're doing to bridge more connectivity within communities, not just in one region, you know, um, you're focusing on how do I help people in New York, talk to people in New Mexico, talk to people in LA, talk to people in... London, I don't know. You're probably all over the place. Nationwide right? Nation, and yeah. possibly Glasgow in the next year. Oh, hey, okay, Glasgow. Um, <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the evolution and, and what drove you to want to take what you were doing successfully just as a first AD in your own world to then dive in and say, I want to broaden my work and actually build a stronger community out of that. Yeah. Um, 
education has always been very important to me. Um, I, I firmly believe that none of us can do this if we do not know what we're doing. And the only way we know what we're doing is by doing it and having mentorship and help to get it done. And so I, I was blessed. John Roman really took me under his wing. And when I started, he told me, listen, your boss is only trying to do two things. Two questions they ask themselves constantly. What's wrong with this picture? Why aren't we shooting? That's all an AD says to themselves. It's very simple. And so you look at the monitor. I've got to move that background actor. That prop doesn't belong there. This light just went off. And you fix whatever the problem is in frame. And boom. Why aren't we shooting? The lockup got blown. The actor's not ready. Director's not at the monitor. When we stop asking those questions, all of a sudden we can shoot. So guidance and mentorship really helped bring me up. And so with that, when I was a walkie, uh, sorry, background, background PA, um, because I could sit in holding, I wrote this book, Getting It Done, The Ultimate Production Assistant Guide. And it bridged the gap between what was being taught in film school and the creative, directing, writing, cinematography, and what we actually do, standing on corners, getting people breakfast, uh, understanding how to fi fill out the Exhibit G. And so I started educating and doing these small workshops and mentoring people one-on-one, -on -one. became an assistant director. Again, we started talking about that toxic environment. I got out, I started doing indies. And this brings us to 2015, 2016. So now I'm in Corsicana, Texas. I'm shooting this movie called Warning Shot. And I've got David Spade, James Earl Jones, Bruce Dern with us. And uh, they were incredible. Absolutely incredible. Um, my gaffer starts getting into it with my DP. Um, basically, we, we shot this entire movie on an 85 and a 135 and about 40 to 60 feet of dolly track. And if anybody understands what I just said, it means it's a pain in the ass. Um, so basically, you have a lot of distance between yourself and the subject, and the lens is super tight. So from here, I could have a close-up on someone in the back balcony. And <laughs> a lot of coordination. The, uh, the gaffer starts yelling at the DP, there is no way that I am laying that much cable. And when they started cussing and becoming obstinate, <laughs> we sent them packing. So I personally have a zero tolerance policy, especially when I produce. And when that person created toxicity, we sent them home. And now I'm in Corsicana, Texas, six hours from the nearest slider, let alone a qualified human being. Um, so we ended up flying someone in from New York. I did check Mandy. I checked Staff Me Up. I checked Craigslist. They didn't have a qualified gaffer in Corsicana, Texas that we knew that we could trust. And so that was kind of the birth of Crew Me Up, where I turned to my producing partners and said, we need to solve this. So problem number one, I'm in a location where I don't know what resources are available whether that's humans or whether that's gear, rentals, services, where can I look? Problem number two came when I got back to New York. And I've literally got 600 production assistants in my Rolodex, but it takes 60 phone calls to find six of them that are available. And I need a product that was gonna fix that. So that was kind of the birth of Crew Me Up. And originally it was very similar to Staff Me Up and Monster and Indeed in that it was a gig posting platform. And then the pandemic hit, so we, we launched this in January of 2020. And March is when all the work went away. <laughs> so, uh -huh. so we pivoted. And we went to education and information and telling people about the safety protocols. I, I was blessed. November after the pandemic, I, I was back on set isolated, doing COVID testing, having production meetings where one person was where I am, the next person was where you are at the table, the next person was back by the, uh, the booth. Um, so we, we figured it out and we made it work and yeah. And so now you have an app. Yes, I have an app. You gave um, birth to an app. Should we get into the demo? Yeah. Great. Do you guys want to see a demo of Crew Me Up? It's pretty cool. <laughs> Um, shameless, if you have not downloaded it already, www.crewmeup.com, Android, and, uh, and on the iPhone. Um, and there's a very good reason that we should all download it, which I am about to show you. Mm, yes. Perfect. Welcome to Crew Me Look Up. <laughs> there it is. All right. So I'm going to do this on my phone. Um, please don't pay attention to me. Just look behind me. 
so when you open up the app, it starts with the people. So right now it's all about you, and we call you Krubies. Also the name of our French bulldog, who you can see on the website, and is our company mascot. Um, so everybody's got a profile. You can search keywords. Uh, you can do this by name, by position, by location. Or you can create filters. Again, location, union, non, position. And if you were to filter by position, you can actually pick multiple departments. And so you can filter an entire department for every single position, not just one at a time. Now to the right, we see this little person. If I were to push that, it's gonna bring those folks into my Kruby list. So this is my favorites or people that I work with regularly. And so I'm just gonna come into Kelsey's profile. Kelsey is a good friend and script supervisor on the show New Amsterdam. She is currently available, seeing as how the WGA just negotiated and SAG's still on strike. But here's her resume. There's her website. So this is how we, we support crew members and how people can vet you and learn about your work. Now, you can also give a quick bio, and then in the top right corner, people can message you, or I can make somebody a direct offer. So we said that Kelsey is a script supervisor. That's continuity. Boom, is this a new project? Is this an existing project? If it is, tell us which existing project. And then when I click continue, so tell us where this is, because that'll help us determine a local. Is it union or non? She is IATSE. Script supervisors are local 161. And then we come into schedule. So let's say I want her for every day of this job. I want her to be staff. Click that button, and boom, it's gonna do that automatically. If it's not staff, I can click the calendar and just offer her specific days. So this would come in handy for a tandem unit or for additional hires beyond your staff. Different types of compensation. We said this was union. I'm actually going to change that. Um, Non-union, great. So now, credit, money, credit plus meals. If you're a student, we have options for you to make offers. Um, on top of this, additional compensation packages. Box kit fees, if someone's renting your gear. Meal money, if you're a DGA member or traveling. Travel fees, mileage, housing allowance, per diem, all of it can be negotiated as separate packages right here in the app. So that whole system is initiated from the profile. And then we're gonna come in here to projects and you'll be able to see, so these are posts that I've created in the past. We can see the activity. And I'm actually going to go to a different job. So tie me in. We hired a producer. And we can come in here, click listing activity. Um, so with that project, I can get to it through this screen. Or I can go to my calendar. And here's the fun thing about the calendar. I can click change availability. If I'm working, I can request a day off. If I'm not working and I don't want to work, I can say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'd like to take off. And now if I go to my personal profile, oh, I chose the wrong dates, didn't I? And now when we go to my profile, 30th through the 2nd, I'm booked out. So everything there is instant. Now if you are booked on a project, the dates are going to show in green. So if I click any of those days, it'll tell me what project I had. And when I click into here, this is the new system. So this is a project management system with a start date and an end date. And when I come into Kruby assignments, I'm an administrator here, so I can see multiple departments, producers, ADs, arts, continuity. And I'm just gonna come into this AD department and see, so we've already hired our first, and our first can now go out and hire their second. And if you have, say, two second seconds, we just click Add. Well, now we've got three, now we're back to two, and now we're back to one. So you can design the entire structure of all of your departments right here, day by day. If they're staff, they'll automatically show up every day. If they're additionals, they will only show up on the days that you've offered them in the schedule. Now to actually make an offer from the screen, click Assign. Here's people that we recommend. Or we can take you through that process. You can do a direct hire, or you can also create a post that people can apply to if you have the time to do it. 
So we still offer the old system, and we've also offered you a new way of connecting. We can handle multiple departments. So you can see here a summary of what each one looks like, how many positions have been created, who's been hired, and you can also come in and see the details. We can also handle multiple units, like we were talking about. So a tandem unit, an insert unit, a stunt unit. Um, locations are a way of fast tracking, so you don't have to constantly retype those same locations over and over again. We can store them here. And then call sheets. So I can upload a PDF call sheet. Again, Dr. Death. Here's the back with all that crew that we were talking about. I can do a preliminary call sheet so I can get that out before lunch. We can then do a final call sheet, which I don't have uploaded here, um, but that will be shared with the crew. And then actually from here, if I click the dot, 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 I can text it, I can email it, I can save it to my files, or I can upload a replacement version if something changes. So when we talked about how to join the DGA and collecting your call sheets, this is a great way for you to find them, download them, and keep them all in one place. Um, so that is the hiring system. All of this is free. If I haven't mentioned that before, we, we don't charge department heads because your job is to make the movie, to hire your crew. It's not to go out and find these people and take your time and search for it. You're not getting paid for that. It's just a function that you serve for the production company. So we will never charge the filmmakers. Instead, we make our money through relationships with vendors. So let's say you're in Illinois, Chicago, and you need camera rentals. Come over here to Camera Ambassadors, and getting a quote is literally as simple as hitting that button. So great way to source vendors. We're looking forward to more local Albuquerque vendors on the app. Yes. <laughs> and, Sign up, people. And you can also add these folks to your vendors list, similar to the MyCrubies list if you want quick access to your regulars. Um, how to sign up? Top left corner, become a vendor. It's that easy. The incubator's on there. I'm getting there. <laughs> um, so, so this is the main functionality of the app. And one thing that we found that was missing was community. And so in order to fix that, we've added a new feature, which is groups. And this is why I suggested that everybody download the app before we start, because if you scroll down here, welcome to the Albuquerque Film and Media Incubator. Hey, Check whoa, whoa. out our administrator, Carrie Rose. Thank you. And we can see our members. So. Carrie approves everybody that applies to this group. And if somebody comes to Albuquerque and wants to find a filmmaker, all they need to do is come right here. And if you are already on the app, yes, you've probably gotten rando invitations from me, even if you don't know <laughs> me, to join my group. And you'll continue to get those until you do. <laughs> and that's Crew Me Up. That's Crew Me Up. Yeah. So you can really manage an entire project, build a whole team. Do everything through one free app, thanks to Joshua Friedman and his partners. We should mention your partner at yeah. Crew Me Up. We should mention oh, your partner. Oh, absolutely. I, I don't do this alone, by any means. Um, so I, I have a co-founder. His name is Voravong Nishampasak. We call him, right? <laughs> we call him V for short. Um, he's incredible. He is, he's a stunt performer. Um, we met because one of our investors owns a stunt training gym in Brooklyn. He was training there. I was uh, just visiting, and when he was talking to the owner, he's like, what do you got going on? I was like, well, I got this thing, crew me up. Oh, I help with tech. And so he made the introduction, and V has been a very solid rock and very supportive partner. Um, unfortunately, he is in New York right now dealing with floods and a one-year-old baby, but, uh, but he wishes he could be here in full-on supports. We'll get him next year to come with you. Oh, he would love that. Yeah, love that would and be And he great. can talk about stunts. He can show you some things. Yeah. I also want to make a special shout out to Mila, who's in the audience. She came out to visit Josh and see Albuquerque. And so welcome to the land of enchantment, Mila. Thanks so much for joining us. And uh, do you have anything else you want to say? I know we're down to a few minutes. Yeah, we got to go. We got to wrap. They're Copy cutting that. us off. Um, yeah, <laughs> if, if you want to learn more, if you have questions, just come find me. I, I'm here till Monday. Yeah, he'll be here through the end of the festival. He's very approachable. You'll yeah. get to know him for the rest of right. your life. Hit you us up on hi. Instagram, at Crew Me Up. Yeah. So let's give one more round of applause for our wonderful guest speaker, Joshua Friedman. Download the Crew Me Up app. 
We're going to go ahead and close the theater so we can reset for the next events. I actually don't have on record everything that we have going on today, but there's wonderful film blocks all afternoon. Um, make sure you check your, your badges for the festival schedule, and we'll see you guys out there. Thank you so much.